Okay, um, improving sustainability with low cost turbidity sensors. So what we're going to discuss is the fact that the evolution of turbidity measurement has changed to the point now where there are sensors that can help us in a more plant, complete plant process, improving sustainability. So sustainability, we know that, that you know, the goal of that is to use as little as we take from the environment, make the most of it, and create as little waste as possible. So within a plant and utilization of turbidity, we're gonna to drive towards reductions in water consumption, waste creation, and product loss. Of course, product loss and waste creation kind of map together, but what we, when we think about product loss, this is not a simple, easy fix in a plant. And so we have to make multiple changes within a plant and the efficiencies to get to those world-class levels of less than 1% product loss. Quantifying what we know. Everybody's done it at home. You take a glass, you've got a glass of, maybe you mixed a drink or a juice, and you look at it and you qualify it by saying, well, that looks strong or that looks weak. And what you're actually doing is you're making an optical judgment or measurement of the turbidity of that product. Turbidity as a measurement is actually the effect that a particle in presence in a solution has on a light beam. And in the case of when we do that qualitatively with our eyes, what we're looking at is whether we can see through that, whether the light passes through that tank or whether or through that glass, or whether the particles actually stop it. The difficulty with that measurement is it's not quantified. We can determine, yes, it's heavy, or yes, it's, it's got a high turbidity, a low turbidity, but we can't assign a number to it. By moving to a turbidity meter for this application, we now have the ability to qualify, quantify that particle concentration. So as, the, as on the picture, you can see the beakers, we could, you know, we could make the assessment visually that that goes from a very diluted solution to a very concentrated one, but by running a turbidity meter, we can now assign values to it and make decisions based on that. So why turbidity or why particulate? Well, particulate ties directly to the products we're trying to manufacture, the raw materials we're trying to use, right? In the case of milk, we look for butter fat as part 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 particles and other solids, which also map up into a measurement of turbidity. This also aligns directly with water that's discharged from the facilities. So if we're sending water, wastewater into a municipality, they're using turbidity on their side to assess BOD charges. So we're doing an apples to apples comparison when we're monitoring with turbidity in our plant to our discharge waters. In particular, and this, this really comes under the banner of the low cost turbidity sensor, the technology we're gonna focus on is a backscatter technology. And backscatter by design means that what we're going to have is a light sensor that's going to emit light into the product stream. That light is in turn reflected back towards the sensor off of the particles that are present in that stream. And we have a receiver that's going to measure the intensity of that returned light. Then we can have our electronics do a calculation. The more light that is returned, the higher the turbidity or higher particle concentration in that liquid. That becomes our relative turbidity measurement. So, we're pretty sure turbidity is the right parameter to be measuring at our plant to improve these goals. What has changed because turbidity has been around as a measurement for quite a few years, actually several decades. But what has changed to make this now appealing today are a few things. First off, uh, compact design comes from electronics being able to be miniaturized, like small microprocessors. This yields a device that's very easy to do in installation. We have a reliability increase in the, in the actual measuring elements, and in particular the LED lamp. Turbidity of past always relied on an incandescent lamp as its light source. And by doing that, we had a lamp source that actually deteriorated rather rapidly with time and needed constant adjustment. We couldn't have a plant full of turbidity sensors if we had to add two or three maintenance individuals merely to keep them running. 
but an LED light source now gives us a device that gives us reliable, consistent measurement for years and years of operation. Next up was the introduction of sapphire lenses to be used for that, allowing the light to transmit through and into the product stream and back. Prior to sapphire being utilized, Pyrex or glass was utilized uh, as far as the window, and there were a lot of shortcomings in that selection of materials. Pyrex and glass both etched with CIP chemicals, which meant we had, again, a degradation in the measurement. But in addition, we had a risk associated with glass in the process. No one wants to introduce glass into a dairy process in particular because we can't retrieve it back out. Sapphire, on the other hand, is so hard, it's the second hardest mineral on the planet. And so we no longer have that issue of it breaking and fear that it enters into the product stream. Another thing that's changed is the backscatter technology allowing us to have an insertion type device. This is the tri-clamp fitting, meaning that this sensor goes into standard piping short outlet tees or instrument tees. We're not reliant on cutting the line and making an inline custom housing to affix turbidity to our process. That simplifies our installation, obviously, but it also reduces the overall cost because we're not buying a lot of special fittings to install these devices. I'm going to go into a couple applications in particular where improvements in sustainability really can come to be. And the first is going to be phase transition. Phase transition really is a, a, a term that affects a lot of places in the plant. What we're actually talking about is the determination of when the product in the stream changes to something else. So that could be one product pushing another product. It could also be a product being pushed out by water. And in the same breath, it could be water being pushed out by product. So it's the understanding of when does that phase change from water to product, product to water, or product A to product B. We've picked a, a schematic of a pasteurization system because it really demonstrates the difficulties or challenges that we have in trying to recover these products. We have, we have heat exchangers, we have homogenizers. These are equipment that don't reliably release product when we push through with a water push. And so the use of the turbidity sensor really is optimal for this application. The basic application, and this is how we you know, affect or install a device, is we're going to take a turbidity sensor and we're going to locate it at the end of that process schematic. Right? If we're looking to recover all of, the, all of, let's say, the milk in a pasteurization, pasteurization system, it's important for us to know when the water makes it to the end. And so we're going to locate a turbidity sensor at the end of that process. That turbidity sensor will get wired into the same PLC that's doing plant control. And that, that merely is, is logical in that there is an interaction that occurs between this measurement and what we're trying to do in that process area. We already are switching valves with that PLC. We're simply going to add this information to make those decisions more reliable. And that PLC now gets programmed with that responsibility of functioning off of set points that have been determined to make that decision that it's no longer milk, it's now transitioned to water, we should be recovering high solids waste, or we should be going to drain with low solids waste water. The advantages that we can give by going with turbidity over other, other usages, such as air blows or water flushes with timer base, is we have a fully compensating system. When you install a turbidity sensor, it's like having an individual always looking at the outlet of that pipeline and making a determination when it's milk, when it's not milk, when it's water. That means that we have a system that constantly compensates for any changes. We may make changes in a piping schematic over time. Timers don't compensate for that. They just push more water or not enough water to recover the product. A turbidity sensor gives us that continuous feedback that that water line has to run longer. And then lastly, we save ourselves from diluting our product, right? The most important thing we're doing is producing a product to specification. And if we put unnecessarily put water into that finished product tank, we've diluted and corrupted it. Turbidity spares us from that. 
as a basic application, I'd shown you that the pasteurization system was certainly a place that you'd apply turbidity, but the reality is that there are, there are locations throughout a plant for turbidity to be used in this way. Starting from the offloading of product into storage, raw storage tanks, then following that into the batch system to be able to chase out all of the ingredient passages before we go to clean every day. Then as we mentioned, the HTST for clearing that system and also chasing that liquid to the final storage. And as a last application is to the filler, right? We have our most expensive product in that pipeline and we need to recover that and get that into packaging and out to our customers. So we have to have a, a turbidity sensor at that feed so we can push that product out, make sure that we package up as much of that product as is possible. A second application that I'm going to go into is the CIP process. And in particular, we're affecting the CIP pre-rinse control. So in this application, we're going to locate a turbidity sensor on the return line from the CIP skit. Again, we're going to tie it into the PLC that runs the CIP system, but it's a little bit different than in the case of phase transition in that we're no longer looking to make a decision on when it's not product and when it's water. Instead, what we're trying to determine is when is the system clean of soils so we can move on to our, to our cleaning phase, our caustic phase. And so in this case, that, that ITM or, or the turbidity sensor is going to sit in the line. We're going to look at the signal. We're going to see a spike up when we start our initi initial flush on that because we're going to have all these soils breaking off the pipeline and coming back. We're going to take that high solids. We're going to sort that and use it for additional processing or additional purposes in the plant. And then we're going to go to drain and we're going to watch that output signal until it plateaus. And then we know we've effectively removed all the soils that we can from the system and advanced to the next cleaning step. The advantage on this one is we have far more effective rinses than the typical timers that are used for this system. If you have a system that's running multiple products, we already know unless you had specific timers for each product, you already are not dealing with them effectively because clingage rates, thick products don't clean from pipes as quickly as thin products. Uh, we can flex the CIP system to any loop and we have automatic correction based on the fact that we're measuring the returning liquid. So we get an optimization of our water use by on the rinse by using just enough water. Not too much, but not too little. We get a reduction in the use of cleaning chemicals because we are rinsing enough. And then lastly, our CIP cycle time is reduced to the minimum, not meaning that it's as short as possible. Oh, I should say it is as short as possible. It's at the right length. So some other considerations that I think I touched on them on the pre-rinse, the sorting aspect for turbidity. When you see that high, when you, when you're, when you, know, you no longer have product and you're going to send that additional liquid somewhere, you're not going to send it to drain because that's to drive our BOD. But we're able to sort that. We're able to put it either to further treatment in a plant or we may be using it for animal feed or the like. We have a device now that completely compensates for viscosity. So if we have multiple viscosity products, this device is simply going to tell us when the right time is to happen based on the turbidity or the particle content. And then lastly, and I showed it early in that picture, but it's particularly good for tanker flushing where you have a really high variability of the device that you're hooking to and the way in which it reacts. And the tur turbidity again gives us full compensation. So to wrap this up, talking about the benefits of using turbidity, it's flexible to multiple conditions, right? If we're running a timer today, we have an inflexible system. It doesn't compensate for changes. By running turbidity, we flex to changes that occur in the system, whether it's water pressure, whether it's the product, whether it's changes we've made in the system. We're going to always get that optimization. We're going to use as much water as is necessary when we do rinses. We're going to have that reduction of cleaning chemical use, so it's going to be on the financial, but again on that waste generation side by reducing the use of caustic. 
And then with all of that, because we've optimized these processes and reduced the amount of waste we're creating, we're going to have a better wastewater uh, management. We're going to have much lower solids going down the drain.